Welcome to everybody. Uh, we couldn't have chosen a better day to talk about the role and responsibility of media. And uh, it's actually a great feeling to know that I am moderating two journalists. So, uh, you know, the seats have uh, changed at least for a bit, Maya and uh, Veer. And of course, it's great to have Sam with the other perspective for all of us. So as we said, this is not to drive any conclusion. This is an exploration. The conclusion you can drive at the end of this exploration or not. Um, what is most important to us is to cover a large canvas because media in and of itself is a large canvas. And more important than that, it covers the entire canvas in at least a vibrant working democracy starting with the legislature to the executive to the judiciary and everybody else. So it is in this context that we will be talking about the role and responsibility of media, also in the context of the shifting landscape of media itself with the emergence of social media, internet, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we are sitting on uh, the eve of an election in a country where the president for the last four years has run the country on uh, Twitter, but more on that later. I just want to start with a quote that I read, which I think puts this session in perspective. And it is from uh, Professor Michael Schutzen of uh, the School of Journalism in Columbia University, where he says that professional media, uh, so professional journalism is the rough first draft of history, not the last word, but it is the enemy of pride, pomposity, and ignorance. So with that, Maya, may I turn to you and say that, you know, in your, in your very uh, rich career spanning television and now teaching and so on, uh, in your experience, what have been some of the most significant shifts that have impacted the independence and objectivity of uh, journalism? And I'm talking about journalism with a capital J. Uh, thank you so much, Vinita, and uh, to the hosts for inviting me to this, uh, this panel. And I think Lekha pointed out that it's, it's a distraction from uh, all our attention on, on the US elections and the results tomorrow. But we'd like to, I'd, I'd like to sort of stay focused on the issue at hand because it is indeed crucial. Um, interesting that you put me on the spot first, but I will try and, and answer your question. Um, I mean, independence and objectivity uh, are sort of essential to the ethos of good journalism, but uh, objectivity is a is a loaded word. And I mean, independence can be measured with a metric of where uh, journalists are getting their their funding from, uh, where their salaries are coming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think objectivity is a harder word to kind of define and narrow down, and that's primarily because. There are many stories that we as journalists cover that warrant us to be objective, but not necessarily neutral. And mm -hmm. this is a very fine distinction that I actually point out to many of my students at Media Studies uh, as well in Ashoka University, which is that there has to be a difference. I mean, there is a, there is a line between not taking a side or taking the side of what is a perceivable need for justice. And I think that, at least in my, the way I was taught in my generation of journalists, certainly a lot of women journalists who were out there on the field when, when I began my television career, um, this was always something in the back of our minds. We need to be objective, which is that we need to ensure that we're telling all sides of the story. But how we weight um, uh, the the various factors uh, and, and whose side do we weigh in more heavily on often determine that objectivity meter. Uh, and I think, you know, that that happens on a case by case and a story by story basis. Typically, it did not weigh towards power. It weighed away from power, which is that you held power accountable uh, for what 
you know, the promises they may have made to a public and electorate during an election, uh, it weighed against the, those in government because you wanted to ask why certain schemes were not implemented because you saw people who suffered as a result of that lack of implementation. Uh, it weighed in favor of victims of injustice, victims of violence, uh, collateral damage in an armed conflict. So there was, while there was objectivity, there was a side towards which that objectivity leaned. Um, and I think that's somehow lost in the times that we're in today. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one part of the answer to your question. The second part, I think, in terms of major shifts, I mean, I, I joined television or the, the, the video news broadcasting uh, industry as an intern in news track when a news track had become a weekly news magazine, wasn't a monthly anymore, but was still circulating on VHS tapes at lending libraries across the country. Um, and there was um, a very clear uh, focus and um, impetus given to field reporting, to the visuals you brought back in, and how you were able to combine visuals and text and tell the story. Um, I moved on very quickly to NDTV, and that was a seminal shift because you saw uh, a private production house, which it was at that point in time, and not a broadcaster, uh, essentially uh, be able to produce a 20 minute news bulletin that went on to Doordarshan. And there were daily battles in the newsroom. Uh, there was, you know, one gentleman named Mr. Raja, God bless his soul. I don't think he lived very long after retirement. And I, you know, I feel very guilty that many of us made, uh, you know, the end of his career very difficult because every evening would be a yelling match over the phone about, no, Mr. Raja, I, if you're going to censor my story, I'm not going to put it on there. I don't care what you say. And it was like a daily thing. Uh, so partly it was fun. We kind of looked forward to our engagement with Mr. Raja at four o'clock in the evening. But, you know, we moved from that very quickly into you know this 24 hour news cycle and from there convergent news rooms with you know the website and digital media and now where we're actually seeing um, you know traditional media mass media which is reaching more than one person uh, the the public sphere has now become dominated by the digital public sphere so you're not looking at the at the newspaper in its in its pure form as a broadsheet you're not necessarily watching TV uh, for the nine o'clock news and the headlines, but you are a permanent audience on a device which can stream information to you permanently. Uh, mm -hmm. Add to that your social media uh, presence and the fact that you now instinctively go to your Twitter feed or your Instagram feed when you hear something may have happened. You don't switch on a news channel. You you sort of log on to see what hashtag there might be and do a quick Twitter search to find out more information. So we're in a space where social media has become mass media. Social media has, in a sense, um, you know, for all its ills, and there are many problems with that, and we'll come to that later in the discussion, has in a, has in a way replaced uh, the information systems of traditional media right. without the editorial filters of traditional media. So that's sure. really where we are. And that's the biggest challenge I feel that's confronting us as media professionals, media educators. Uh, you know, it, it, it is a challenge because we don't mm -hmm. know on which side uh, sort of uh, things are going to sway. Yeah. I, there, I know there's lots of others to say much more on this, but, you know, I thought that would be open with right so um so maya i think you used two or three very interesting uh words um can it, can everybody hear me i'm not getting a signal. we can hear you yeah we can okay. hear you okay so maya you used excellent words like you know objectivity and neutrality and um, i want to go to uh veer next you know you've been an editor in fact you were one of the youngest editors and my question to you really is that, you know, it is impossible for any journalist, no matter how professional you are, to not frame the reality or the facts that you're seeing on the ground. So as an editor, how do you determine how best to frame the story? And, you know, what points to highlight in the story? Mm, I'm not sure this much useful editors these days, Vinita. I think basically 
we've seen two different developments. The first mm -hmm. is that for many years, until a few years ago, there was a time lag between the development of the Indian media and say the, I we hesitate to use the word global, but see the, say the Western media. Our newspapers for a long time were pretty bad. When they got better, say the best Indian newspapers were not as good as the New York Times. We came to television late. By the time we were doing TV news, most of the world was used to it. So we were always behind. What's happened now is a fractured multimedia environment where neither newspapers or television alone dominate the landscape, but there are multiple sources of information. And in that sense, we're pretty much now on par with the rest of the world. This mm -hmm. means that we face many of the same problems as the rest of the world. The first one is the old one of revenues. The old model in India of newspapers, Vinnie Jain said memorably that the Times of India was in the advertising business. And he yes. was right because the whole newspaper model in India, unlike say America or England, was almost entirely advertising based. As advertising moves away from television and from newspapers, they are struggling. Moreover, it's not clear on the internet whether an advertising model can be instantly successful, whether it can work, whether Indians are willing to pay for news behind paywalls. So that's struggling too. So all over the world, media are struggling to find a good revenue model and we are no different. The other is a problem I think that Maya alluded to, which is the problem of alternate facts, which we are going into news uh, an American election. Mm -hmm. The old idea was that at least if you, know, if you couldn't trust everything you read in the papers, there were some objective sources, you trusted what they said, to answer your question, an editor looked at stories, sifted facts from propaganda, lies from truth, and gave you a rough idea of what was happening in the world. That vision has now been turned upside down, partly because of technology, because of the multiplicity of media in which, as Maya says, if something happens, you don't go to so-called mainstream media, you go to Twitter. So that news there has not been verified, it's not been vetted. So for every objective fact out there, there are about a million alternate versions of that scenario. That has devastating consequences <clears throat> for society as we've seen in India and in America. There's a second factor which is purely Indian, which is that unlike America, where most people who consume media today grew up in households where there were newspapers, same as pretty much true of England, or even if there weren't newspapers, they looked at television news. We've now had the development in the last 10, 15 years, a very good one, an encouraging one, of a new middle class of people whose parents weren't necessarily in the middle class. So these people grew up in homes where they didn't necessarily watch television news, they didn't necessarily get newspapers in the morning, and they're now eager and hungry for information. They have now available a multiplicity of options. They no longer have that old reverence for mainstream media, nor do they necessarily trust it. And there are millions of people telling them that what mainstream media is telling you is rubbish, so don't believe it. So we are now in a worse situation than America in which even television channels will lie to you, newspapers will lie to you, social media will lie to you. So the truth has never been more elusive than it is. And for a large part of the readership, Oscar Wilde said of America that it's the only society that went from barbarism to decadence without the intervening stage of civilization. I sometimes feel something like that is now true of the Indian media and its consumers. We've gone from a slightly primitive situation where we were trying hard to catch up the rest of the world to this decadent free for all where there are no facts, there is no truth, people believe what they're told. So I'm not optimistic in answer to your question about the role of an editor in this situation. It's, it's, you know, it's fascinating you say that because I think all of us, and now we are revealing our age, grew up at a time when, you know, the editors were as iconic as the, uh, you know, the print media or whatever they were responsible for. And you read that newspaper because of the editorial, which represented the view of the editor. You know, today's editorials are a bunch of people who are called to write about whatever um, you know, whatever the happenings of uh, the newsroom are. But yep. this is a good segue. I'm going to come back to this and examine this whole role of, you know, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, who to believe, who not to believe.
proliferation and fragmentation of media, I can't think of anybody better than Sam who knows the media uh, scene in India inside out. So Sam, last count, I think there are what, 118,000 newspapers and periodicals in India and some 300 plus TV channels and so on. Could you share with us a little bit about what does this fragmentation mean? Also, increasingly we are seeing a consolidation of media ownership amongst a few corporate houses. What does that do from an advertiser's perspective? And then I want to circle back to both Maya and Veer in terms of saying, so how does this change the life of the journalists? Sam, over to yeah. you. Yeah, thank you, Vanita. You know, the problem as I see it, that we are discussing today, and what has prompted you to choose this subject is actually, to my mind, not very new. It has maybe intensified a bit because of one or two events. But I, for one, have been sort of living with this problem ever since the days of Doordarshan, when you know we, we persuaded Doordarshan to start a scheme called sponsored programs and I was instrumental in bringing a lot of I think what my colleagues on this panel may find cross film directors <laughs> uh, to produce programs for me which would drum up rating points and that is what at that time advertisers like you wanted. And that is how I built a successful media business out of it. Now, the honest truth is, as Veer also alluded to it, that media is nothing more than a business. I mean, if you were in the business of selling biscuits, NDTV is in the business of selling news and their purpose or, or any other channel and their purpose is to make as much, increase their bottom line as much as any other business would want to do. That I think has become the overriding objective of all media in the last 20 to 30 years, as you, as you yourself said, you know, that, you know, gone are those days where we held the editors in such high esteem. And I think, I don't know, I would use the word maybe unfortunately from a personal point of view, the media has always been underpenetrated in India. And it was always the intelligentsia and the upper echelons of society that were exposed to media. And I think some media moguls thought that why should it be so? Because you know, we are operating in a country of 1.3 billion people and the largest circulated newspaper circulation is peanuts. So therefore started this movement that let's give the newspaper free or virtually free. And that way we will increase penetration of the product. And to a considerable extent, I must say that worked to the extent that Times of India boasts that it is the largest circulated English newspaper in the world, some of our some of our papers like, uh, you know, Jagran and Dainik Bhaskar are indeed very, very huge when it comes to circulation and readership compared, I mean, I think they are beaten only by some newspapers in China. But what has happened in the process is that they have had to pander to advertising. And advertising, as you know, 
advertisers use media for their own purpose they don't use media with the objective of improving society or having an eye on you know what should i do to improve the world there's the single minded purpose why they spend money on advertising is to sell their product and therefore they want to reach the largest number of people at the lowest possible cost and that is why they appoint agencies like madison media to help them do that now in the process you know obviously what happens is that priorities begin to change everything gets a little bit of dumbing down because you want to cater to masses you want to register numbers you want to show that you are the biggest you are the largest you have millions of viewers or readers and stuff like that and because of that you know a lot of a lot of sort of principles of of good journalism if you i may put it goes out of the wind having said that let me tell you that this is not a new phenomena because i came across a saying by mark twain he is supposed to have said in his time that if you don't read a newspaper you are uninformed and if you read a newspaper you, <laughs> you are misinformed right right so, well only so, mark twain could have said it <laughs> so well so prophetically so so in my view you know i think i have often been accused you know of supporting the wrong things in the advertisers interest and advertisers are often accused of supporting the wrong thing but the reality the truth is that each one is trying to meet their own objectives so sam this is a you know this gets us to an interesting crossroads which is that yes media was always a business you know and to be in business there is a certain code of conduct but we have seen for example in 2009 the big thing that happened around paid media where the press council of india appointed two very senior journalists to investigate what had happened in terms of money that was paid etc cetera, etc cetera. so i want to turn to uh, so let me get your view on this whole drama that we've seen unfolding about not distinguishing between media and stories in the media that have been paid by somebody advertorials posing as stories you know as long as the code of conduct is identifying what is news what is reporting versus what is a planned story or a planted story or a paid story the problem now is that it is very hard to distinguish between what is an opinion what is a view and what are news so uh, you know your thoughts sam and then i would like to move with the same question to both maya and uh, veer to throw us some light you know including on that report by the press club of india which actually was watered down and i don't think went very far but you know sam your point on this whole thing of paid so, media so, as long as we are identifying yes there's no problem the problem is when you don't identify so so vinita i also sit on the board of ascii you know advertising advertising standards council of yes. india yes and we have a guideline which says exactly that what you're saying that if it's a paid for communication then it should be flagged off as advertising and therefore you will find that in many newspapers of uh, you know you will see sometimes on the top right hand corner you know uh, words to the effect of a sponsored feature or an advertorial or an advertising supplement for example you will see in the bangalore times because they've taken it to another extreme the entire ba bangalore times 
has one thing written on the on its masthead which says that the whole thing is an advertising supplement yeah, which is so tiny that, <laughs> which is so yes. tiny that you miss yes. it yes absolutely now you see all of this comes from the fact that when you and i started at started our careers 80 to 90% of the revenue of then newspapers who were you know the ruling media barons used to come from the reader from mm-hmm. you and i having to pay the subscription money yeah and the newspaper editors of those times derived power from the fact that you know there were a few Hundred thousand maybe people who used to read the newspaper, but then the thought sank in with some promoters of newspapers that why should we be talking to a hundred thousand people or two hundred thousand people in a country which has over a billion people? So let us increase penetration. So the same way as how you know a marketer of products would say i must increase my distribution and i must increase my depth you know they began to focus on how to increase their circulation and came up with this what they thought was a brilliant idea that let us sell this newspaper which actually cost 10 rupees to print at 1 rupee and we will more than make up this 9 rupees by getting the advertiser because the advertiser will be impressed with the fact that you know i have so much circulation and i'll also achieve something else which is by pricing it at 1 ru- rupee it is predatory pricing and it'll keep my competitor out yeah so, so i'm going to come on this yes Yeah I'm going to come back to this point on competitiveness uh, Sam I want to turn to Maya for a second you know you said something very important Sam which is that a newspaper is a product like any other product I would in a way uh, you know challenge that a little bit which is to say that the product of a newspaper is in the public interest it is the right of the public to know and therefore it is the responsibility of the news media to give me as a reader reality and news which you frame i accept that every journalist will put that reality into a frame which is why we have the same news but you know different journalists highlight different points of that news so to that extent there's a little difference between who journalism is responsible to or journalists are responsible to and what a product company is responsible to but we'll come to the revenue model uh, sam in a minute i want to get maya and then veer's view on the whole thing and if you could also comment on you know what happened in 2009 with you know this nexus between uh, the politicians and newspaper owners and you know what was paid uh news etc cetera, etc cetera. so maya your thoughts on this please so i mean we were told very clearly in journalism school that if you want to you know make a million bucks this is not the profession for you uh and i think uh, yeah <laughs> and i see uh not only that that's really the truth but that it's become harder and harder uh, so many of my own friends my contemporaries even those who've joined the field uh you know a few years after me who are trying to work independently uh, are struggling i mean they they don't they're living from one grant to the next they don't know who's going to pay their um, their costs of being on the field um you know bills are piling up uh, independent websites that are willing to carry their work for very nominal uh costs don't have the resources to pay uh, and so you know their invoices are pending this is a story of of the you know freelance journalist today and in fact also of a lot of um journalists working for smaller media houses that are not just not getting paid their salaries on time um i think the 
I agree with you. I think that journalism and journalists need to be held to a higher standard of conduct than uh, you know somebody like you who uh, is selling a product. And I, I have the choice of buying that product or buying another product depending on whether I can afford it or not. The news is a product that is meant to be for everybody in the public interest, for the public good, etc. cetera. Um, I understand that and this is this has been an issue because in India, um, the fact that there have been even subsidies on newsprint or government advertising, which has become a large uh, sort of revenue generator for television and print as well, has meant that the pressure has been uh, sort of off in a sense, the management to push for to, for more subscriptions. I mean, you know, News Laundry has a tagline today that says pay to keep news free. And it really does boil down to that, that people who can afford to pay for news should pay for news so that those who can't afford it are getting verifiable uh, information that has gone through editorial filters and are, you know, you know are, are not having to pay through their nose for it. So there has to be some medium. I, I've, I've always been on the, on the reportage side of things and there was a very deliberate choice I made to stay away from management of newsrooms as well because I know it's a difficult space. Um, I also want to just go one step further and to say that, um, you know, not going into uh, into specifics of, of uh, nexus between uh, politicians or journalists and things like that. But I think that when we saw the sort of post liberalization highs of the Indian corporate sector, the private sector, there was money coming in from everywhere. So you could diversify your revenue as well coming into a newsroom. You were not necessarily overly dependent on one advertiser. And mm -hmm. so you were able to kind of hedge your bets, so to speak, and allow different journalists to do the kind of work that they would do best and bring it to the table. I think with the slump, with the way the economy has been, um, you know, and the state that we're in today, I don't know if corporates are spending the same amount of money on advertising that they were even five or you know seven years ago. And so you're dependent on government advertising. You're dependent on the pressures of government advertising, and it comes at a price. So how do we increase subscription? That's the revenue question. But I think, as I said, that I, I do feel that for journalists who are committed to going out and getting the stories, things are really difficult right now because they're not being able to pay the bills. So are you saying that uh, journalists and some media houses don't have the resources to actually do the credible, authentic media reporting that you were talking about? Because I could argue, basis what Sam said, that with more resources, there is greater freedom available to journalists to go and you know, find the stories that nobody is telling. Hmm. Um, and I think that's also part of journalistic endeavor, which is to make people aware of what is going on around them, not just, you know, not just the, the big things that happen, not just, you know, the Bollywood and the business and uh, so on, but, you know, other stories, uh, it is left to well, the short think. answer is no. I mean, the, those resources are not there the way they used to be, even when I was working in a newsroom three years ago. Uh, seven months after I left NDTV, 400 people were laid off. Uh, the, the, the news team that was actually out there going in, we did a show called India Matters. I don't mm -hmm. even know yes. if you remember it, but it was never given the advertising and it was something that we were committed to doing, but its slot was 10.30 on a Friday night. Who is watching news television at 10.30 on a Friday night? Because no advertiser was willing to back that kind of program. So when 400 people were laid off in the newsroom, guess what? The India Matters team had no choice but to be part of that 400 because there was just no money to sustain. What's happening as a result is that you have greater dependence on news agencies. As far as uh, television is concerned, there is one particular news agency within the country which has um, you know, a massive amount of uh, of that uh, that resource diverted to it. There, there, you know, every news organization is subscribing, which is why you see the same video across different different channels. It's the same video, a different anchor. I mean, those resources they they don't exist the way they used. 
reports have come down. Uh, television was an expensive business because mm -hmm. we had three people going out onto the field. So you had airfares, you had hotels, you had local transport, uh, et cetera, right. et cetera. I mean, we've spent nights on railway, uh, you know, on trains just so we could avoid hotel fees in the last few years of India Matters. I've mm -hmm. done that. Yes, because it was yes. the only way to get the story. We said, okay, fine, right. we'll just, you know, take an overnight train. Right. Uh, so, so do you know, know, you know, the glamour of television is a whole different thing. I mean, this is the reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sam, yeah, Maya, Sam? yeah. Sure, no, sure. I just wanted to react to Maya's point. You know, the, the, the television advertising market is about 30, 35,000 crores. 10% of that is approximately the money that advertisers spend on news. News is already over-indexed on advertising. What do I mean by that? What I mean is the, the share of news in terms of viewership is about 6 to 7%, but its share of adx is 10%. If you take English news, its share of viewership would be less than 1%. You know, a typical English news program gets a viewership of 0 0.002. Yeah. 0 0.002. So, you know, you're talking about reaching 2 to 3 million people in India compared to, say, a Hindi news channel, which may reach 60, 70 million uh, people and IPL, you know, which would go to over a hundred million and more. But the point I want to make is that I don't think it's just about adding, obviously there isn't an unlimited amount of money to Maya's point, but the point is that news is managed by a set of chief executives who are governed by increasing their bottom line. I mean, they are evaluate. They are evaluated, and not based on the news that Maya puts out. They are evaluated based on what is their viewership share and what is their bottom line. So, Sam, I think you made a very interesting and a relevant point, which is that you know the interest of the media houses, the interest of the advertiser and the interest of the journalist are no longer coherent or in harmony because if the journalist wants to put out the real stories that are happening there, then the market, if you like, for that real story doesn't exist because of course, to your point, it doesn't get the viewership and so on and so forth. So I want to turn this for a second and I'll come back to the same point to you, Sam. I want to turn this to Veer and say, you know, it's almost an existential angst. You know, if you say the role of the journalist is to actually hold the powers that be to accountability, to hold accountability to authority. The role of the people who are putting the money in there is to get, you know, your highest TRPs and so on. And we've got some very interesting things happening right now where, you know, media is being accused of manipulating TRPs and that's taken off on its own uh, steam. So in, in, a, in a society where aligned interest really should be driving what happens, and to Maya's point, you know, even when we sold products, we were regulated. I mean, you have to have standards that the regulatory authorities hold you accountable for, for selling any product. And over and above that, there is a self-regulation that industry does, whether you like it or not, is an, a different matter. But in the case of media, now with fake news, misinformation, we've also got a budding industry that is doing a fact check on what we have been told by the media or what we've been told by politicians. You know, there is Alt News, there is India Today's fact check and so on. So in this very quickly shifting and changing scenario, you know, what is the best that journalism and journalists can do to protect the very unique role they play in society? 
without being intimidated, which also is, you know, increasingly happening. So if you'd like to comment on that. We... Well, let me go back to the origins of where all this came from, which is the conflicts Sam identified. He identified a conflict between what you described as being the public good and journalism, and mm -hmm. the fact that all businesses ultimately have to make money and media companies are businesses. He identified a second conflict, which is between a subscription model and an advertising model. So let's deal with both. The first one, the one about journalism versus just profit, etc., is an old conflict. It's been there since the beginning of time. The truth is, as Maya said accurately, journalists don't make much money. So nearly everybody in a newsroom could have made more money if they went somewhere else. So the reason they're there is because they believe, perhaps usually, that they can make a difference, that they subscribe to some kind of higher calling. Unfortunately, the people who run those companies, and I don't just mean the owners, even the executives do not share this belief in a higher calling, as Sam said accurately. They are judged on their revenue management, on whether they reach their targets or not. So there is institutionalized a conflict between the management side and the journalistic side. It is very well and pro probably reasonable to say that if a media company does not make a profit, it ceases to exist. And how does that help a free press? But it's also worrying because if you say that you must only do things that are popular, that actually increase profitability, that would things come out? For instance, you could bust tomorrow a very big agricultural scam, which caused losses and into the agricultural sector, the deaths of hundreds and thousands of farmers. I don't think you'd sell a single extra copy because of that. So should you abandon that in the pursuit of profit? Because, hey, you're a business after all. Or should you say, no, I'm not just a business. I should do that. It's a conflict. There is no one single answer to it. Yeah. It depends on where you stand. The second conflict he identified was between subscription and advertising. Now, all over the world, the newspaper business and television has usually been a combination of both. It costs much more to produce the New York Times than they charge for it. So obviously the cover price has to be subsidized by advertising. The problem in India is that we've broken from around the 90s onwards, the traditional model whereby the reader paid for the paper and the advertiser subsidized it to a model where the advertiser pays for the paper and you basically give it away. And then people get it pushed through their door or they don't bother saying they don't want it and they don't read it because it's given to you free. And then you go around bragging, my circulation has gone up. India is the largest newspaper circulations in the world, etc. Now, again, I'm not taking sides in this conflict, but the problem with this conflict now is a real and pragmatic one. As advertising is moving away all over the world from the newspaper industry, and it's bound to happen, it's happening to some extent in India, it'll get much worse. If you are in an economy where there isn't that much advertising coming to you, and your whole newspaper economic model is based on advertising, where are you? Yep. What are you going to do? You basically told the reader to get lost, saying, I don't care about you. The fat cats of advertising are going to bail me out. Who wants your two rupees, three rupees? Well, hey, now you probably need this two rupees, three rupees. And in the case of television, I think the wheel has turned globally. America has traditionally been a country of free broadcast networks financed by advertising. Yet increasingly, advertisers are looking at streaming services because that's where the big spenders are. The people who watch streaming services on the whole have a more attractive demographic. They have a higher medium income. And streaming services don't actually work on the basis of numbers so much. They work, A, on the basis of perception, and B, they work on subscription. Almost anybody who watches a streaming service has paid for it. So all over the world, this media and advertising are the same thing model is coming under strain. That's what's happening in India. So Veer, let me challenge that um, yeah. a little bit and say that, you know, if we, if we follow this thing that at the end of the day, you need the resources to, to be able to run, um, you know, a news channel or uh, a newspaper or whatever, and therefore you need the stories to what Sam was saying, which are popular and so on and so forth, then over a period of time, in any case, you lose the base of your subscribers who subscribed to you in the first place because you brought them news that they cared about. 
And if you are now giving me news that is really of no relevance to me, I, as a consumer of news, look elsewhere. You know, therefore, when you ask people, where did you get the story from? You'll say, okay, my WhatsApp group sent it to me. Who has verified the story? Where does it come from? So increasingly, we are actually, you know, we are actually by not putting out the stories that people care about, people are then moving away. So the circulation is not my uh, source of revenue. It is advertising, which is my source of revenue that then gets me into all kinds of behaviors that we have recently seen. So where does this break? And I want to ask another question. And that is, you know, one of the newspapers, at least that I respect, who I think have stuck to their subscription model is the Financial Times. And you know, no matter what happens, it's like, if you want to read the Financial Times, you pay for it. And guess what? People pay for it. And it's a newspaper that is a profitable newspaper. So I'm saying it may be one example, at least one that I can think of, which is saying that when you give readers value, when you give them authentic news, when you give them something that they believe adds to their knowledge. Because you know the other thing also is, your industry, the media industry, also sets the agenda for public conversations, for civic conversations. Where are we getting our information from? And if increasingly I'm getting my information from alternate sources, you know, then I don't know any longer what is fake news and what is authentic news. <laughs> so how do you deal with that dilemma? No, I couldn't agree more with you. I think I used to say this to people when I was at the Hindustan Times and we were locked in this battle with the Times of India, which we fortunately won more, almost every quarter, about uh -huh. which was the number one paper in Delhi. I used to say that it's probably important from an advertising point of view, but from a journalistic point of view, pay no attention because there are ways of increasing newspaper circulation, chiefly giving the damn thing away which have very little to do with news or with genuine readers. Always with a newspaper, you should make your focus your core reader, the kind of guy who wouldn't mind paying for the paper, who read it because you slip it through the door at 50 paise or an add-on with some other paper. But ultimately ask yourself this question, would he read me if I made him pay for it? And I think we tried to do that, but not enough newspapers and not enough journalists have asked themselves the same question. It's the same thing with television channels, which have become loud, the Masha channels. You need to ask yourself when you're on that channel, if people had to pay properly for me, and I wasn't yeah. subsidized from all kinds of things, would people do it or not? Or mm -hmm. too often as journalists, we fail to ask that question. And we've descended into a certain lowest common denominator mode across media, which has led, I think, partly to this trust, lack of trust in media that you talk about and the switch to alternate sources. And I think ultimately it's this advertising dependent economy with no respect for readers that will hurt the Indian media very badly. So Sam, Vinita, how do you, yeah. Sam, how do you feel about that? So Vinita, let me tell you, when you were saying a little while earlier, I wanted to tell you and Veer that in fact the problem is much worse because when newspaper managements actually dumb down, if I may use a very loose term, uh -huh. their editorial content, they don't lose readers or viewers. They actually gain readers or viewers. And that has been their experience. They may lose, they may lose the Vinita Bali but in their numbers and also mind you these are not blank numbers when we look at numbers we get details also by socio-economic classification and stuff like that the so unfortunately you know as they say you know you get what the customer deserves so this is what is happening today so newspaper uh, managements are also faced with this dilemma and television new, uh, uh, managements are also faced with this dilemma that, you know, if, if they had a very, uh, you know, sophisticated product, 
that appealed to the intelligentsia, then actually the business model would have to dramatically change and they would no longer be able to meet their business objectives. But Sam, we have seen, we have seen examples like the one from FT that I've just quoted. The so give me thing, an Indian no, no, example. No, no. Give so so just, example. you know, so one sec. So I want to, you know, you said that when editorial is dumbed down, circulation increases. I could actually interpret that very differently and say, I dumb down my editorial. I know I can't get subscribers. So I give the newspaper free, which is showing my circulation. And I'm making up for that lost revenue through circulation, through advertising by showing to the advertiser that I've actually, you know, printed so many lakh more newspapers than I ever did before. So we, all, all of us, you know, are creating a vicious cycle that is perpetuating that which it is supposed to, um, you know, correct. And that is that the role of media or the role of journalism is to, is to hold accountable power as well as authority. And, you know, it is no wonder, therefore, and if I were to superimpose on this, and Maya, I want to ask you this question, if I were to superimpose on this, you know, some of the recent things that we've all read about, which is intimidation of journalists who have actually dared to expose stories, whether those were related to COVID or any of the other protests, et cetera, that were happening. And, you know, lo and behold, we've got in what is it called? The World Press Index, India's rank has dropped to 142 out of 180 countries. How does that make you feel as a journalist, as somebody who decided that you were going to pursue this career because of what, because of uh, the role it played in society, because of the role it played in a vibrant democracy? Just um, a thought on, on the numbers and the intimidation. I mean, unfortunately, these are not new tactics. I mean, a lot of my predecessors mm -hmm. have also suffered and, and we've have, we have a long history of the government trying to intimidate the press throughout our uh, sort of, uh, sure, history of sure. uh, independent India. But I think in terms of, you know, that was often something that was... Uh, at the editorial level, you heard of editors feeling the heat and having to, uh, you know, they were being called into government offices and being made, uh, being asked to explain. But at at the reporters level, um, that would happen, you know, in smaller towns and with stringers who would be under pressure from local politicians, local businessmen, uh, the 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 sand mafia lobby, for example, uh, in Western Uttar Pradesh, or uh, you know the the um, the ones who were trying to acquire land in uh, the Naxal hit areas of Bastar. I mean, you you had local journalists and you know people uh, under pressure. I think the needle has kind of shifted because now it is your prominent national news reporter, very often sitting in Delhi or Bombay, uh, who are now in sort of, you know, uh, in the middle of this kind of uh, con story or controversy or whatever you want to call it. Look, I mean, I think I, I made my point right at the beginning, which is that I do believe that, you know, we're, we're not meant, we are in the business of journalism, and I use the term business loosely, we, we chose this as a career path because there is something we felt we were trying to give back to society. I mean, whether it was mm -hmm. about, you know, exposing um, gender-based violence or caste discrimination or, um, you know, the abuse of political power and corruption, whatever have you. I think, you know, the media has been at the forefront of some major shifts uh, in yes. public perception of government and governance. So that to me still remains a core value of journalism. It's very easy for me to say that, look, they're all consumed by the suicide of Sushant Singh Rajput and the allegations uh, of uh, the fact that his ex-girlfriend may have murdered him. So let's just give them that rubbish every single day, even though uh, investigating agencies are saying something else or, you know, how, how important is it uh, when we're battling a pandemic, when we've got China at our frontiers, when we've got an e economy that's tanking, 
is this the story we should all be consumed by? Then you ask the question, why is it that we're being consumed by the story? Who is pushing the story? Why is it on certain channels and certain newspapers and not the others? And here again, actually, I found an interesting distinction between the way television was handling the story and some television channels and the way print was handling the story. You did see a little bit of a stepping back in the newspaper the next morning. But I mean, to me, that begs the question of, do we just give the viewer what they want or are we telling the viewer what to want? And I think that that is the, the bigger and deeper problem that yeah. somebody out there is telling the viewer, you want this, so I'm giving it to you. And we have Sushant Singh Rajput, lo and behold, you know, on the poster of Bihar election campaigns. So I'm sitting here and saying, any good journalist will join these dots and the finger is going to point somewhere where there are powerful people and they're going to be uncomfortable with that. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what's happening. Right. So, um, so Sam, you talked about ASCII and, you know, the standards that advertising and advertisers have. Have you perceived any change in the conversations? Um, you know, when it comes to advertisers taking a stance and saying that if this particular channel or a particular newspaper is, um, you know, violating uh, principles that I as an advertiser hold sacrosanct and important, I am going to walk away from it. Are advertisers making those calls or those tough calls? Uh, I'm afraid not, Vinita. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe I thought so. Maybe one or two or three. I mean, mm -hmm. there are there are there are twelve thousand advertisers on television, mm -hmm. and there are uh, about two lakh advertisers on print. Right. And I mean, I'm talking about uh, you know a few who may express mm -hmm. this kind of sentiment. Yeah. That it is my job to improve standards and therefore I will not support this uh, uh, publication or channel because it's doing something that I don't believe in. Um, and I think what people tend to do is just leave it to their CMOs and CMOs leave it to media managers and CMOs give media agencies extremely tough targets we are supposed to bring down CPRP every year, year by year, the cost has to come down. And, uh, you know, our remuneration is linked to that. So it's, it's all one very big elaborate uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, unless the promoter advertiser feels, uh, you know, as I told you that day, I, I have often believed that a principle is not a principle unless it hurts. So, yep. you know, it's, it's not okay for an advertiser to voice a view that he is, uh, you know, uh, really disdainful of what's happening. Uh, but then at the, in the boardroom, he says, my CPRP must be brought down by 15%. How does he expect his CMO and his media agency to deliver that? you know, if he's laying down the target. So, so, so there are these uh, issues. I mean, you know, if, if you want to improve the world, then you've got to start by paying a price for it. Unfortunately, most people are willing to talk ad nauseum on how to improve the world, but not happy signing the check. Yeah, and I think it, it ranges all the way from, you know, advertisers to individuals who are we willing to pay for authentic journalism or are we willing to pay for journalism that is actually That's doing what true. it is meant to do. So, you know, I think so, uh, Veer, I think probably the last question before we uh, open it up to questions from the audience, you know, in this in this state, which is actually uh, you know, tugging from many different points of view. You know, there is the interest of advertisers. There is, you know, where is the money that is supporting this whole industry? Um, you know, what media can do for me as an individual to promote me? 
you know, whether I'm a corporate person, an actor or a politician, and, you know, all of those kinds of uh, conversations that are happening, what is the way out, if any? Or what is the path to take, you know, from the point of view of still staying with uh, the responsibility of authentic and good journalism? I think that some things have always been obvious. We had the example of Sushant Singh Rajput and the way it was covered from Maya. And right. we had Sam saying accurately that the more down market you go, the more your circulation increases. There's always, this has always been true. The number one New, New, New York newspaper for years and years has not been the New York Times. It's been the New York Daily News, which is a tabloid and is loud but has never read anywhere else in the world, not even talked about anywhere else in the world because it lacks the authority of the New York Times. We don't in India make a distinction between tabloids, which were function only on circulation and real newspapers, which function like the Financial Times on a slightly higher pedestal. The reason we don't make that distinction is because advertisers don't make that distinction. They just look at big numbers. They say, we don't care about quality of readership, etc. We just want lots and lots of numbers. So if you are going to run a newspaper on advertising economics, as we have, that's, some, that's a trap you've fallen into. Even so, there are differences in television channels. Many tabloid channels went with Sushant Singh Rajput, and some non-tabloid channels didn't do that. So that di difference does ex exist. Now, in terms of what we can do, I don't think we can change very much in print or television. We haven't changed it over God knows how many years. But in a sense, it's a little bit like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, because none of this is going to matter in five years or six years. In five years or six years, mainstream media is going to be in so much trouble that there's going to be a whole flood of new media and most of these questions will be asked, but they will be asked much less often and they'll be much less relevant. Yeah, we're already seeing this. Um, yeah. And you know, that, that, that trend has begun. It's only a question of, uh, you know, the speed and velocity with, uh, because you know, the direction is very clear. Um, and yet, you know, at least I am of the belief that there are people, even in India, who are willing to pay for quality. There are so many of us who are subscribing to newspapers from outside of India because we believe in the authenticity of the news they provide. So, uh, you know, at some stage, there has to be some conviction that uh, there will be people, fewer in numbers, that recognize and are willing to pay for quality, whether it is quality of journalism or quality of advertising, um, et cetera. So I, uh, Vinita, Vinita, yeah, you know, I just yeah. want to say on the on the note that you are uh, uh, saying, I just read today something very interesting, mm -hmm. which is encouraging that Netflix in India yeah. has reported a fairly hefty profit. Now, Netflix, as we all know, uh, they are, of course, not into news, they're into entertainment but they charge something like 800 rupees uh, per month per, per month. subscriber, right. you know? And if they are able to do a business and their business model doesn't include advertising, it's only subscription. And if they could, uh, the, you know, do very well in a country like India, I would think it's very encouraging news. So I would tell you, not to be disheartened, <laughs> and I think uh, good no, no, times I, are going to come. <laughs> I am not disheartened. I am firmly of the conviction that there are, especially in a country like India, of 1.3 billion people, at every strata, there are enough people who recognize the value of what is being given to them. And if they don't get it from Indian media, they will go outside of India, but we are, there are people who are seeking value. So I think it's also lazy on everybody's part to assume that the lowest common denominator is what works. Because we have also seen, and your example, thank you for sharing that, uh, uh, Sam, of Netflix, is a good one. When you give people quality, some people recognize quality and are willing to pay for it. They're willing to pay for it in all kinds of products you know, from a biscuit to a chocolate, to a car, to hopefully uh, news. 
Uh, we've exceeded our time Thanks. a little bit. I am actually looking at the questions. Uh, Hi, <clears throat> I'm looking. And just, to... and just a question for the people who are asking <laughs> the questions. If there is anybody in specific who you would like to direct your question to, uh, please do that. And my other request is just keep the questions as brief as possible because I see there are quite a few questions and we'd like to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask the question. Sorry, Prem, over to you. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is for anyone who wants to take it on. Uh, I'm referring to Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, where he says that since television, when the same device gives us news and entertainment, news becomes entertainment and our level of attention drops down and society's ability to really critique the public realm gets eroded. So I was wondering whether the news industry, whether in India or elsewhere, is looking at this problem and trying to figure out some way of tackling it. Maya, do you want to? <laughs> I don't that? know about tackling the problem, but I mean, it's, it's an interesting quote that you picked up. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, the same device is giving us both things, but one can argue that television has been that device for a very long time. Um, the other side of this is that actually when, uh, and I think this dates back to CNN and the first Gulf War uh, of uh, 91, where you actually had um, reporters on the ground bringing back video uh, from, uh, from the Gulf War there. And it was being, or it was a Department of Defense video that was being given out to uh, the sort of first cable news network in America. And, and people were watching it like it was a video game. You had images of uh, missiles and fighter jets, as, you know, and they were, they were real, but they kind of simulated what you did at the arcade. And you already collapsed that difference. Um, it's, it's, it's really just gone on and on and on from there when, you know, journalists are out in the field. I mean, one of the guidelines that, and even, even the National Broadcast Standards Association in India, uh, for which, you know, all television news companies were originally meant to be a part of, of course, we have our, uh, our, um, the sort of the counter to that by, by some of our new television uh, industry colleagues as well. But leave that aside. I mean, there was very careful thought that was supposed to go in uh, to what images you would choose for a, for a story, um, what you would be able to depict through those images. And, you know, some of those were based on the editorial sensibilities of the newsroom. Some of those were, were based on what would patently be seen as criminal or insightful, uh, both under the CRPC and uh, under Article 19.2 of the Constitution. And there was this healthy conversation. Uh, I mean, I don't buy this argument about how, because we're consuming it on the same device, that's kind of collapsed the distinction. Television has been around, radio has been around. We listen to music and we listen to news. We watched movies and we watched the news. So it's a convenient and lazy excuse right now uh, to sort of fall back on that. Uh, what has happened, however, is that the consumption of both entertainment and news because of you know, these devices has become individual. So in a sense, we don't know what even in our own homes, our own families might be consuming, how much of what they're consuming is fake news, is misinformation, is verifiable, is something that you know clearly is possibly real, but in the realm of propaganda. I mean, I've had a situation where uh, you know somebody in my family, a young teenager, suddenly was wearing a red a MAGA hat, a Make America Great Again hat at the age of 13. And none of us for the life of us could figure out how he had got to this point. And then you realize that they're watching things on YouTube, they're watching things uh, on their so, uh, social media feeds or in the, on the privacy of their own devices. And I think that's the real problem, not the collapsing of entertainment and news on the same device. It yeah, is the fact I, that we're not being I mean, able to do this as a community anymore. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. I don't think it is the medium, it is the content that that medium puts, uh, puts across. And I would say, you know, take the BBC, they do documentaries, they do news coverage, they do hard talk, which is as hard as it gets. And, uh, you know, they do entertainment as well. But uh, 
can we go to the next question please lekha uh, yes next we have chintamani rao so you may ask your question hi chintamani hi hi vidita hi sam <laughs> hi uh, well I, i don't think this is a question or a comment it is to do with uh, vidita you mentioned the financial times as uh, you know uh, charging for content but today mm -hmm. the new york times get 60% of revenue from from subscription right in, in this highly digital world where, and where in a, in the us where print is collapsing much faster than it is in india they're getting 60% of revenue from subscription mm -hmm. i wish media owners had the guts to charge for content if your content is worth paying for charge for it if it isn't make it now i couldn't Sam agree with you more netflix is is profitable times of india famously advertising driven has put its digital digital content behind a paywall who has the guts to follow them there is a website called the ken i don't know if you're aware of it yes it's a subscription only website right uh they just put out one detailed research story every day mm -hmm. and people are paying for it absolutely so, because the ken as an example believe they have the content that people will be willing to pay for Mm -hmm. and as you said there are people who are who want who are willing to pay for good content they may be 10% or 5% of of you know of the uh, uh, your potential market in volume mm -hmm. but they are the ones who will pay for it yeah yeah absolutely um anybody would like to comment on this sam or veer thanks yeah, I, uh, would, I, would, i would say the way forward is indeed to roll back a bit to the 70s when i think there was a balance of 50 50 you know 50% coming from the reader or the viewer and 50% coming from advertising you know that is a that is a delicate balance if it is maintained i think you will soon see you know a clutch of offerings uh, that will begin to appeal to the upper echelons of society mm -hmm. veer any thought from you on that no question <laughs> speaks for itself yeah. okay uh, lekha could we go to the next question please biju parmeshwar uh, hello uh, based on the discussion that two uh, quick questions one is um, if the news media is not doing a good job with credible news and people get their news from all over the place like whatsapp and so on will that ultimately lead to the death of the news media because no longer any reason of their threat to, to exist that's my first question the second one is um, uh, when we talk about quality that you pay for new york times financial times and so on maybe the economist uh would that model lead to global consolidation to a significant degree is there space then for only you know a dozen or whatever uh news uh, you know newspapers or or magazines as compared to all the thousands locally thank you thanks sam do you want to take the second question and then we'll turn to uh, maya and veer for the first part of the question yeah i personally think no i'll give you a personal anecdote you know in the in the last week of march during the lockdown i got fooled by a whatsapp message which came to me from somebody i knew in the financial world that you know the uh, the financial year is being extended to june 2020 and i thought oh boy that's quite an event and i looked for it the next day in the newspapers and i saw nothing of it i looked for it the following day and then i sent the whatsapp back to the sender saying hey where did you get this from he said look i'm sorry about it but i only forwarded a message that i got to you so actually this i have i have become very aware of you know the amount of fake news that is going on in in whatsapp and i mean 
the degrees are unimaginable. I think if you're talking about fake news in uh, uh, TV or print uh, compared to fake news on WhatsApp, I mean, there, there is no comparison. So I, I would not be so, uh, you know, happy to write the obituary of any of our media. You know, yes, it is true, digital is growing. I mean, digital has grown from 4% to 23% in 2019. And in the first half of this year, which is or most of it was locked down, it grew to 30%. But television is holding on to its own. I mean, especially sub, uh, August, September, October, television is doing extremely well in terms of advertising and viewership. Uh, print has suffered a bit, but print again in September, October is looking up quite a bit. So whilst there is a downward, slow, gradual downward trend in print, which I think will be difficult to stop. Uh, this downward trend, I dare say, is not because of the quality of journalism is going down. You know, it, it's, it's just part of the way the media are being consumed. Actually, Sam, to add to that, if you look at digital content in every industry, you know, the share of e-commerce has gone up compared to people walking into Correct. stores and buying. So I think media is also seeing what other industries have seen. You know, you take the music industry. There was a time when we all bought, you know, CDs and so on. Correct. Then it became you started consuming music one song at a time. And today, you know, we are all consuming music on, uh, uh, you know, Amazon Prime and so on and so forth. So I think it's a sign of the times. Uh, but uh, um, Veer, would you like to comment on, you know, th the same question from your point of view and then Maya very quickly? Quick answer because we've only got about five minutes left, yeah. which is I agree with what Sam says completely. But the reason he wasn't fooled ultimately was because he was able to check with the newspaper what happens when people stop reading newspapers and that's happening, happening increasingly. Yeah. Maya, what are you seeing? Uh, you know, you're also teaching. What are you seeing? Are you seeing any differences in the way the, uh, the young people are consuming news or accessing news? So I think that's something that, that uh, newsrooms have to sort of start catering to because we obviously, you know, we're a large population and a large young population as well. They want information in, you know, they, 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 their attention spans have shrunk because of social media and their devices and they want newsworthy short bites so in shorts for example is something that does very well with children or the al jazeera short videos uh, and, and and sort of a combination of the image and text together it doesn't have to even have a voiceover uh, that's one kind of uh, news consumption and the other remarkably i find they're either doing these shorts you know 20 second 30 second snippets or then they're reading 3000 word uh, long form narrative articles and there is no space for that 300 word or 500 word news report which i struggle to get them to learn how to write um, but you know there there isn't that kind of um, attention. I think as far as social media and encrypted messaging platforms like WhatsApp, etc. are concerned, I know that we saw a, a sort of an uptick in awareness of the kind of pitfalls of being uh, dependent on this for information. Uh, back in 2018, when there were these instances of uh, the lynchings of, a, you know, a child kidnappers, I think it was in Karnataka, if I'm not mistaken. And WhatsApp was summoned by the government and, you know, they were asked to explain, etc. I think um, as a platform, they decided to give us that arrow to tell us that something has been forwarded. And I saw some behavior change with that, some consumption uh, change with that. The minute you have an arrow that tells you that this message is only been forwarded, the, the, the sender doesn't necessarily know where it originally came from. Uh, I mean, it's something that's kind of leading to a little more questioning. Right. But I come back to the earlier point I've made, which is that 
we don't really know what somebody sitting next to us on the couch is doing on their phone and exactly. i think that's really uh, the big challenge i mean you know face to face communication the 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 thesis to be written on how you know behavior behavior has changed because of communications technology um, but i think certainly at 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 the school level at sort of i mean uh, we were talking about creating digital media literacy modules for uh, fifth standard students mm -hmm. because that's when parents are giving them a phone whether mm -hmm. we prove of it or not yeah, it yeah. matter uh, they they're getting a device without necessarily parental supervision so how do we ensure that you know the digital natives going into universities into the workforce are a little more astute and mm -hmm. and sure. are able to discern what sources of information they should use i mean right i don't know if that answered the question but i thought that i would just segue into some of this so that uh, this conversation shouldn't be left only talking about traditional media and not what the challenges are or exactly the, the, With the young benefits people. are of mm -hmm. the digital world that we inhabit yeah, yeah. uh lekha i think we have time perhaps for two more questions Do you do you want to yes. bunch a couple of questions, or how do you want to do it? Um, we have just two lined up. Okay, okay. So let's uh, can yeah. we ask both the questions, and then we'll get the panelists to answer both questions. Okay. Uh, one question is from Amo Joseph, uh, and mm -hmm. suppose uh, she can ask the question. I will do it for her. Okay. Uh, she refers to a tweet by Krishna Murthy, and would like uh, your comment on this development. uh about uh, the andhra pradesh government sanctioning 8.15 crores to bennett coleman Co and company limited of times of india for their proposal to enhance the image of the state and leaders through its policies and schemes unquote <laughs> it's a lot of what we've been talking about and we have uh, proof is what i would say but uh, you know i i see everybody smiling so let's let's get a response from all the panelists very quickly uh maya and sam and veer i'll let veer go first on <laughs> okay veer well i mean what can one say it just sort of <laughs> illustrates everything we've talked about for the last hour and a half and i'm pretty sure that bennett coleman are brilliant at what they've been contracted to do but i mean the thought does occur to you that would they have done this if there wasn't this wasn't a media company that they hope they could influence into giving them favorable coverage in its other outlets i want mm -hmm. sam any no, comment for i you? would i would not dismiss this right away as wrong uh, because most state governments today are big advertisers and they in a way the fact that they have to compete to attract businesses the fact that they have to compete to create a positive image is is to my mind good and as long as the and all state governments for times in memorial have been running you know full page ads and supplements in times of india so as long as the times of india does it honestly and you know uh, signals that this is a paid advertisement or uh, it's an advertorial and stuff like that it's fine it's not as if it is being done surreptitiously that you know hey listen you know i'm giving you this and please write favorable things for me it's actually nothing but an advertising budget and advertising campaign being sanctioned to the times of india I mean, giving this the benefit of doubt and sure, not sure. being cynical no, no. in I assuming, think we perspectives, yeah. uh, and not not assuming that you know it's something done in a whispering fashion to say, "Hey, no, look, no, it's very much just... out in the open." Yes, yeah. correct. Okay, so I, I think can... we have one last question, so I want to make sure that Lekha, uh, um, I think we are running out of time, Vinita. I would uh... okay. you to um, uh, go towards uh, closing comments all right well as we said uh, you know this wasn't a discussion to arrive at one conclusion i think the whole idea was to explore and i thank uh, maya sam as well as veer for you know very honestly sharing their views on uh, 
wide variety of topics. And uh, the conclusions are to be derived by you, the listener, because they cannot be perspective and an informed perspective is most important for each of us to make the decisions that we choose to make on what newspaper to read, what channels to see, uh, what products to buy. So thank you very much.